Okay, um, welcome everyone. I'm sure we will have um, some people join us um, here in the next few minutes, but we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, this is our first uh, food court event. Uh, my name is Philip Palmer. I am the law clerk of Justice James Moore. Uh, he's on the fifth district. He's a justice on the fifth district appellate court. And uh, today I am joined by Judge Aurelia Pachinski, Judge, Judge William Mudge, and Judge Mark Bowie. Uh, before we begin kind of with the panel discussion, um, I want to just tell everyone what food court is. Um, the Young Lawyer Division of the ISBA has put this event on. And the whole goal of this event is just to connect judges and uh, attorneys, uh, especially maybe new attorneys or those who aren't familiar with the courtroom setting, and just to discuss topics relevant to practice in the courtroom and practice uh, in litigation. So we're excited for this new opportunity. Uh, we hope in the future we can uh, transition this to in-person meetings that are more localized uh, so that people can connect uh, personally with the judges that they're going to be in front of. But until that day comes, um, we're going to make the best of our situation. And we have some wonderful judges to talk about effective brief writing today. Uh, I do want to just quickly mention that we have our next food court event coming up on November 17th of this year. It's going to be during lunch once again. And we have at this point, uh, Justice David Overstreet of the Illinois Supreme Court committed to joining us then, as well as Justice Michael Scudder of the United States Courts of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit. Um, so we look forward to welcoming them next time. And uh, we hope you can join us then. So I'll start out uh, by introducing uh, Chief Justice Aurelia Paczynski. Uh, she is a justice on the First District Appellate Court. Judge Paczynski was elected to the Appellate Court in 2010 and was retained recently in 2020. She served as a circuit court judge in Cook County from 2004 to 2010. And as a trial judge, she heard more than 10,000 domestic violence cases, uh, followed by an assignment to hear adoption, election, property tax, and mental health cases. Uh, she's particularly interested in the law as it affects senior citizens and the, disa uh, the disabled and juveniles. She created a program in domestic violence court to give additional protections and services to senior citizens who suffer abuse. Uh, she's also served as the clerk of the court from 1988 to 2000. And um, she started practicing law in 1976 in a neighborhood law office where she developed a reputation for pro bono work, including representing citizens who sued the Chicago Board of Education to keep a local school open, a case she won in the appellate court. Uh, she's a native Chicagoan and a graduate of DePaul College of Law. So let's welcome Aurelia Paczynski. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Uh, next, we have presiding Justice Mark Bowie uh, of the Fifth District Appellate Court. Justice Bowie uh, was elected resident circuit judge of Union County, Illinois in November of 2000. Um, and he retained that position through 2018. Uh, prior to taking the bench, Justice Bowie practiced in the general practice of law with his father, where they had an emphasis in real estate, contracts, wills, and estates, as well as family, civil, and criminal cases. Um, on May 1st of 2019, Justice Bowie was assigned to the Fifth District Appellate Court, and he was elected to his uh, first full term on the court in November of 2020. Um, Justice Bowie, uh, while on the circuit court, heard all forms of cases, uh, including criminal, civil, juvenile, family, chancery, and probate, presided over numerous uh, trials, both complex uh, criminal cases and civil cases. And he's one of the few Fifth District Appellate judges that has routinely presided over involuntary judicial commitment cases, as well as medication over objection hearings uh, in the mental health court. He currently serves as a member of the Special Supreme Court Advisory Committee for Justice and Mental Health Planning, and is a chairman of its Compliance Mental Health and Developmental Disabilities Code Subcommittee. Uh, Justice Bowie lives in Anna, Illinois, 
and his wife, Emily, and their three children, uh, Nicholas, Kaylin, and Peyton. Uh, in his spare time, he enjoys golf, hunting, and playing music. So thank you, Judge Bowie, for joining us today. Last but not least, we have uh, Chief Judge William uh, Mudge. Uh, Judge Mudge serves on the Third Judicial Circuit of Illinois. He is a lifelong resident of, of Edwardsville, Illinois. He graduated from St. Louis University School of Law in 1985. Judge Mudge has spent over 35 years in the legal profession, starting as a prosecutor with the Juvenile Division of the Madison County State's Attorney's Office. He then entered private practice for 16 years, handling both criminal and civil matters. In 2002, Judge Mudge was elected Madison County State's Attorney, where he served for eight years until 2010. Um, then he was elected um, to the third uh, Circuit Court of Madison County. And in 2019, Judge Mudge was elected Chief Judge of the Third Judicial Circuit, and he was recently reelected this year. Uh, he's past chair of U.S. Senate Judicial Nomination Commission. And he's also served as uh, by the appointment of the governor on the board of the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority in Chicago. Judge Mudge currently serves as chairman of the board of the Madison County Child Advo Advocacy Center, and he's actually held that position since its uh, inception in 2003. He's uh, Judge Mudge is married to Jennifer, the first assistant prosecutor with the Madison County State's Attorney's Office. He has two children. Uh, his daughter's a teacher to, at Edwardsville High School and his son works at a marketing firm in St. Louis. So Judge Mudge, thank you for joining us today. Um, everyone, we're gonna go ahead and kind of move into the question and answer uh, section of this program. Um, we would ask that you please make sure that your uh, microphone is muted uh, so that we can hear the judges' responses. And if you have any questions uh, while we're discussing something, please feel free to type it in the chat box uh, and we will have Blake um, kind of take a look at those and pick a few out for us to follow up with. Uh, we will also have a chance for question and answer at the end, um, hopefully. Uh, but we do have quite a bit the judges want to talk about today. So we'll kind of get into it. I want to start out with a fun question first for your, all the panel, uh, just to get things moving along here. This is food court. Um, so I'm wanting to know uh, what your favorite food is or uh, what your favorite meal is. So Judge Pachinski, we'll start with you. Oh, I love Mexican, anything Mexican. Love it. Well, Got to have tacos, right? <laughs> Judge Mudge? I like all kinds of food, but uh, when I saw that question, I thought of uh, a pizza place in Bethalto, Illinois, named Roma's. It's hard to pass up a Roma's pizza. Uh, so I, that, that might be my favorite food. Judge Bowie? I, I tend to agree with Judge Mudge. If I had to go with the last meal, it'd probably be steak and lobster, but the go-to is always pizza. Yeah, my, Chicago my and thin. <laughs> <laughs> mine, mine as well. Um, I had a second kind of fun follow-up question for you guys. Um, have you ever presided over or handled any interesting uh, or bizarre food cases? Uh, bizarre food cases? Yeah, food-related cases. Mm, no. Sports cases, <laughs> yes, but food cases, no. What about Judge Bowie or Judge Mudge? I, I have not, um, no food cases, but anybody's ever said in small claims court, there's always <laughs> something with a dog in a car, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually have. I was a young associate at Luco Brown and Mudge in 1992, and a uh, woman named Elsie Jackson came into the office. She broke her tooth on a Katie did made by Nestle Beich. And it turned out it was a pecan shell that was embedded in the, that Katie did. I, I'm sure most of you know what, it, you know, it's a chocolate covered uh, thing with uh, nuts in it. And, um, um, it was Judge Lola Maddox who dismissed the case um, and we took an appeal and I, it was overturned uh, at the fifth district. And then um, to my shock, uh, the Supreme Court took up the case. And I argued uh, 
well, the first time I ever argued before the Fifth Appellate District was that case. I was scared to death. Um, asked a lot of questions by Judge uh, Justice Harrison at the time. And um, as I said earlier, I was, I was poised for all kinds of questions at the uh, Supreme Court, and I did not receive a single question. But they upheld uh, the Fifth District decision to change the law in the state of Illinois as to food products and the, the foreign natural doctrine. And uh, to those of you who want the site to fact check me on it, it's uh, 147 Illinois 2nd, um, says 147 again, I must have written that down wrong, but it, Elsie Jackson versus Nestle Beitch. That's great. I love that that's your first time uh, up in the appellate and Supreme Court and it, and it just happens to deal with the food food case. <laughs> so that's that's very apropos. Um, OK, so let's get down to business and kind of talk some some stuff that people are here to hear about. Um, it's effective brief writing. Um, so first off, I think we need to start at the basics, which is why is effective brief writing important? Um, my understanding was that judges don't even read the briefs. These cases are all decided oral argument, like in the movies. So am I wrong about that? I will start and say that uh, we do not, in the first district at least, give every case an oral argument. So the briefs are very, very important, not only for the cases that do get an oral argument, but don't get an oral argument. And it is my experience that the justices themselves read the briefs and dig into the record, as well as their court clerks um, who are helping them prepare the, the orders. I think that brief writing is really important, not only for the judge side of the equation, but also for the client side of the equation. And one of the things I always try to make sure of is that uh, use plain English, not, not just for us, the judges who are reading this stuff, uh, you can use all the fancy words you want, but when push comes to shove, it's plain English that is going to be the most compelling. And uh, your client, who is probably not a lawyer, needs that plain English to understand what in the world you're saying about his or her case. So uh, we read the briefs, but I expect that your clients read them too. And so my advice is always to use plain English. And I, and I agree with uh, Aurelia. I, I am reading briefs constantly. Uh, that's probably, a, you know, the major bulk of what we do at, at, at the appellate level, the justices. And, I, you know, I can't say that uh, my mind is made up when I go into an oral argument but I normally have a pretty good grasp of the issues and, a, and an idea of, of my impression vote. Um, but I will say, you know, there are times when we get done after an argument and I've, I've thought I was going one way, but I've changed course based upon an oral argument. So they're both very important, no doubt about it. Right, I agree with that. Judge Mudge, does it differ at the circuit court level? Uh, well, I agree with the two justices, and, and I preface what I have to say that, you know, I'm talking about trial court level. I would defer, of course, to the justices as to the appellate court level, but me and my colleagues uh, read all the briefs, and I find them to be uh, very important um, to do what Justice Bowie just said. Just give me an idea of what's in front of me gives me an idea or an inclination of how I may rule. And like Justice Bowie, I've, I've often had my mind changed at, after or effective oral argument. Right. Uh, I, I agree with Justice Puchinski on the uh, plain language too. Mm. A lot of this legalese just uh, puts you to sleep, you know, you, and you have to reread it to see if you're comprehending what you think the writer uh, said. So brevity, to the point, plain language is very effective with me. And, um, you know, I, I remember the old moniker that I was told, keep it simple, stupid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's uh, not a bad uh, uh, trait to have when you're writing your, your briefs or your memorandums of law. I would just like to, show, show to that, add. It, it, be clear with what you're asking the judge to yeah. do. Yes. Yes, I'd like to add every once in a while you get a brief from and you can just tell that this attorney was either 
over his or her head, lazy, didn't know what he, he or she was doing. And it's just, um, they cite wrong cases, they cite right cases the wrong way, they're uh, incomplete descriptions of what happened or overblown uh, pictures of what happened. So the fact section just has, you know, every minute detail. You, you really have to hone down the fact section to make sure that it is complete, but brief and not repetitive. And that's a skill set. You know, you really have to look at that fact section and get, get that honed down as well as you can so that everybody, the judges, the lawyers, the litigants know what happened, but uh, they don't need extra stuff like it was a blue house. Unless the fact that it was blue is important somehow to the fact situation, we don't need to know it was a blue house. Uh, things like that yeah. just sort of clutter up the brief and you don't need it. So again, as Judge Mudge has said, uh, be brief, but be complete and make sure that you really reread that back section and don't try to wing the ar arguments. When you get to your arguments, don't try to wing it. Make sure that you've got your arguments down pat. And it's a good thing to try and anticipate what the other side is going to say in their mm -hmm. argument and shoot that down right away if you can. If you if you figured that out from at the appellate level, from the trial level, then in your brief say, oh, you know, the defense is gonna argue blah, 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 but here's why that isn't gonna work. So this is your roadmap, but these briefs are really your, your best chance to get your point across. And remember, in Illinois, everybody can appeal by right. So we get 100% of the cases that are appealed, but the Supreme Court chooses their cases. So 99% of the time, the law that's being made is being made in the appellate court. So this is gonna be most likely your last best chance to get your client's you know, foot in the door. So make sure that you do it well. Thank you. Yeah, no. So we're going to get into some of the kind of aspects of brief writing and the, and the the different parts and things that young attorneys should consider, but kind of getting us off the ground here. Do you, what would you recommend be the first step attorney take in when, when they go to prepare a brief or, or when they start their drafting process? So do you have a process that you use? Is there something that you recommend? Um, is there a place that every attorney should start? Um, what are the building blocks to making uh, an effective brief? I'll follow up with ju what Judge Mudge said earlier. Uh, keep it simple and, you know, as short, short as possible. Um, you know, prepare an outline. Don't just, you know, cut and paste out of your trial briefs. Um, you know, if you do an outline, it, it forces you to rethink and uh, think logically and persuasively, because um, li like the the other judge says, we don't need a rambling 40 page brief if 25 will get the job done. Um, so that that's where I would start. I, I, I will echo that. Some of the most effective uh, memos or briefs that I've read have been right to the point. They concede what they must. Mm -hmm. uh, they address the, the problems in their case. Yeah, that's what good trial lawyers do when they're trying to case in front of a jury. Don't hide or uh, ignore the facts that aren't helpful to you or the cases that aren't helpful to mm -hmm. you in, in brief writing. Acknowledge them and show the judge or judges why that case uh, is in opposite or doesn't apply to the facts that you have. Right. But, I, you, you know, these excessively long quotes, citations, recitation of basic law that the judge should already know are, are a turnoff to me. Uh, so um, I, I've seen some uh, reply briefs to a 40 page motion that were two and a half pages long and I, I would give it an A plus over the initial brief. I would add to that, uh... If you are the if you were the trial attorney writing an appellate brief, don't don't make the mistake of thinking that because you were the trial attorney, everything that you did at trial was right. Because obviously it's being appealed. Somebody, the other side, thought you were wrong. Uh, but if you're 
an appellate attorney writing a brief on a trial that you didn't handle, you've got to read that record. You've got to read all those motions and all those orders. You've got to know what happened. You don't want to get caught in an appellate oral argument with some judge saying, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. During this hearing that's uh, that's in the uh, defendant's brief, you know, they mentioned that this happened. What? Why are you telling me something different? You, you've got to read that material. You can't skip it. The other thing is, um, yes, you should keep it simple. I agree with that. And you should keep it brief. I think that it's a good idea to get in the habit of using headlines or uh, sort of making an index of what you're going to write, the, the outline sort of forms, forms the brief. And these headlines highlight what it is that you're going to argue in that section. So if it's, uh, you know, section blah, 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 the Illinois compiled statutes doesn't apply here, or here are the elements that we need to prove, it's good to have that in it. We have a headline about that, and then follow the, the brief about that, the paragraphs about that, so that the judge can focus on what it is that you're trying to say about this particular issue, these particular elements, these, this particular problem, whatever it is. And again, I'll repeat, ask the judge, tell the judge what you want. We get briefs where we don't really know what you want. Do you want it sent back? Do you want it affirmed? Do you want it, what do you want? What do you want to, what are you asking us to do? And most important, don't ask us to do something that you didn't do. Don't ask us to look for some excuse for you to have missed something and fill it in for you because we cannot fill in those blanks. We're not allowed to. Well, that's that's good. I, I, I think that's great uh, advice there with the headings. So you can easily find the section that you're interested in in the brief. Uh, you know, there's a lot of forum motions. And as we know, there's the public and private interest factors that must all be addressed. And so breaking those down so though each of those factors can be found in your argument about each of those factors is, is very important. You know, there's a Supreme Court case out there that I used to frequently cite. I'm trying to think of the, its name right now, but we are required to address each and every one of the public and private interest factors. So make it easy for us to find them in your brief. Having, having a good outline, um, it's probably the best place to start. I mean, you have to have an, first off, I, Judge Paczynski, I thought a, a really good point was if, it, if you're taking over the case and you're writing a brief on it, you got to get to know the case. Like you have to understand what it is um, you're, you're advocating for, what happened behind it, and that way you have a good ground. Yeah. And putting that outline in Hi, the How are you? writing can be helpful. Um, Sir, can't complain. Excuse me, Sharif. Can you, can you mute, please? All right. Sorry about that. Um, so as far as a length of a brief, would you guys, is it's obviously going to be dependent upon the case, but it sounds like the more concise you can make it, the better. Is that is that correct? I think in general it's correct, although some cases are just very, very complicated or you have a lot of issues. Uh, that happens. And, you know, when it happens, it's just the way it is. You know, if you have a 127 volume trial record uh, and dozens of issues, you know, you, you have to be concise about each issue, but you're going to have a lot of them and just bite the bullet. You know, you're going to have to deal with it. And to follow up with what Judge, Judge Pachinski's just said, and, and this is a little off kilter, but I think it goes to it is know your rules. Know, know your appellate court rules, know your Supreme Court rules and your circuit court rules, because there are page, uh, you know, limits. Right. And if you want to go past that, you've got to make a motion with the court to go past that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, make sure you know your local rules. Uh, you know, I, I, that goes a long way. I agree. Right. Um, you know, different cases present different levels of complexity. I, I think your brief ought to uh, correspond to that, but don't throw everything on the wall to see what sticks. You know, let's, let's get to the meat of the matter if you can. Right. Uh, but uh, I think uh, I was upheld by Justice Moore on a very complex case for me. I don't know if you helped write that, Philip, but if you did, I wanna thank you. <laughs> and it was a complicated case that I had a hard time figuring out 
Um, but you know, it, the, the more concise you are in writing your orders as a judge and explaining to the higher courts how you got to the decision you, you reached, I think is real helpful. I, in my early years, I would ar argue motions and uh, get a simple uh, motion denied or motion granted. And uh, so I, I always had a hard time explaining to my client exactly why. But uh, so right or wrong, I like to explain my reasoning. And I think effective brief writing uh, sh should do the, do the same. So to kind of kind of piggyback off something that Justice Paczynski spoke to earlier and, and some of you guys commented on, but when we're talking about the facts section of a brief, it's obviously important because it informs the court of what's happened in the case up to that point and, and the, maybe the facts of, of what are involved uh, surrounding the case. But typically in your practice, is it a situation where you see too many facts, too few facts? Is it something that people need to reel in a little bit generally, or is it something that, um, you, is it a case where you're not getting enough of the facts? Well, well I, I would, you know, motion for summary judgment, the facts are pretty important. I mean, if there's facts in dispute, you need to clearly point that out. So, you know, it, it points to not granting a, a motion for summary judgment. I, I've granted, um, um, I don't want to say a lot, but a good number of uh, motions for summary judgment is we know the standard there is a tough one. You better be uh, very certain that there are no facts in dispute. Um, and, and so uh, I think the facts are really important. I have had uh, people misstate the facts or want you to go find them for them in the mm -hmm. record. Uh, make it easy uh, for the judges to locate the, the, uh, the facts and make sure you're accurate in your recitation of them because there's nothing worse than seeing something that maybe was overlooked or misrepresented to you. Yeah, you never want to misrepresent something because if a judge tracks it down and, and you're not telling the truth, your ship is sunk. That you know They just don't trust you. And that's a problem not only for you, but obviously for your client. So that is never a good idea. While we're on what the things are not a good idea, Every once in a while during oral argument, a judge will ask a question of an attorney and the attorney will say, oh, that's a good question. Well, duh, the <laughs> judge wouldn't have asked it if the judge didn't think it was a good question. So that 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 time saver, that that little space thing that you do to give your brain a chance to catch up with your answer. Don't do that. Well, and. and and I agree. That's similar to saying when when one of the attorneys looks at you and says, "With all due respect, Judge, yeah. we all know what that means." Yeah, <laughs> um, it means I need but, some time. <laughs> you know, and to follow up on 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 the facts, you know, I agree. Cite them accurately. Make sure they're in the record. Uh, but also, you know, you're always going to have some bad facts that you may have to deal with, and don't ignore those. Um, you know, try to slant those, bring them to light, you know, um, you know, be honest and open that they're there. But, you know, as I think Judge Mudge said earlier, you know, then use something to, to say, you know, that's in your favor. So, you know, when, when you leave something out or you state something that's inaccurate, I agree, you, you lose your credibility very quickly. Right. And, and in the fact section, I, th I think that it's important to remember that you are repeating those facts in a neutral fashion. The whole brief is obviously in favor of your client, but the fact session has to be as neutral as you can make it. So adjectives uh, that are opinionated, uh, we don't need those. And we, and we see that for what it is, and it doesn't help. If, if uh, I'm an attorney and I'm responding to a brief that has what I feel misrepresented the facts, how do you guys recommend I handle that? Should I be pointing that out? Should I, if, um, should I highlight that and call it for what it is? Or should I, should, you know, do I expect the court to find that for me or to realize it? Call them out, um, it, but, but do it in a civil way. Um, you know, you, you, Point it out, point out what the, the correct fact is, cite it, cite in the record where it is, um, and, and bring it to the court's attention. 
but again, and I come back to, um, you know, one of the main things, the practice of law is civility right. and you may fight like cats and dogs in that courtroom. Uh, but when you leave there, you go to your local watering hole, you have a drink and tell each other how, how well you did. Uh, cause, cause that's what it's all about when <laughs> you nitpick or, uh, try to put put punches on your opposing counsel. It detracts from your brief, and it in in just to me, it gives me kind of a sour taste in my mouth, so to speak, uh, mm -hmm. regarding that that particular brief. Right. Uh, Being I, simple. I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I I, I agree with com, uh, with Justice Bowie completely. I've had, uh, and some of these folks are really notorious for incivility in the courtroom it turns me off as a judge i it, it you know it, having to hear insults hurled at an opponent i just want to say hey kids why don't you take it out into the hall yeah i think i think justice Bowie <laughs> knows who i'm talking about he he's semi-retired or retired uh st Clair county attorney <laughs> we we see it sometimes in oral argument with where the sides obviously obviously they don't agree or there wouldn't be two sides, but personalities get in the way. And we sometimes see very strident, very, uh, I would say, overpassionate uh, advocacy for your side. And, uh, you know, we don't need tears. We don't need hysterics. We don't need loud voices. We need just a calm, clear, concise statement of why you should win. And uh, I understand that there are passions involved. I understand there are clients involved and that you'd like to impress your clients with a real passionate argument. But we've seen some that were doozies and really they do distract from the actual content of your argument. So the histrionics, take it outside. I want to uh, kind of shift focus just a little bit um, and talk about citations and uh, especially citations to precedent uh, in the argument section when you're advocating. Um, the first thing is, is there, is there a, an expiration date on, on the law or on citations? Is there a, a limit on the amount of time that you, this case is 40 years old, I'd rather not see it. Is there, is there something like that, that that ever gets your attention or causes issues? Uh, not, not for me. So I will say it seems like the older cases were written with much more legalese and they're, they're more difficult to decipher. Uh, I personally like to be cited to the leading case in the fifth district. You know, I, I, I know that those are the folks that are reviewing my decisions and I like shorter citations. You don't have to give me every single site and every publication because it just, you lose the, the words through the, you know, if you need a long site or explanation, footnote it or something for me. Uh, but I, I like short citations, Illinois Supreme Court citations. And if you have a case that stands for the proposition that you're making that uh, is well uh, um, cited in, in a fifth district case that oversees my work, I prefer that. I agree because you think, you know, some of those property cases are still quoting uh, cases from the early 1900s. That's right. Uh, still good law. So, you know, it, it, if, if a law has been that good for that long, cite it. Uh, but I agree with Judge Mudge. Um, if you have recent uh, case law, especially some of these issues that are kind of trending and coming before the court and, you know, obviously just let's be honest, you know, how, how the COVID implications and that's just one that comes to my mind. And, you know, so if you have a, a kind of an emerging law, so to speak, or emerging issue, I, I agree. You, you quote, what's the latest and uh, or cite what's the latest. So, so we know what the current trend is. I think that's true. I think anything with social media, telecommunications, any of that stuff, that's all pretty new. So give us the highest court, best cases that you can find and, you know, let us try and figure out where we're going to go with it. But uh, 
I like to see the old cases too. If they're still good law, if they haven't been overruled, then yeah, I, I like to see that it's that there's a continuum that we've been pretty consistent. Uh, and you're right, a lot of land cases, water rights cases, those are old cases. That's fine. Railroad cases, a lot of railroad cases are old. It's fine. I have a kind of a, a question regarding um, a new um, Illinois Supreme Court rule. So recently, the Illinois uh, Supreme Court has changed their position on citations to unreported Rule 23 cases, right. so that we can we can cite to them as persuasive um, precedent, I guess, for lack of the legal term, I'm forgetting it. But what are your thoughts about that? I mean, is that something that should be avoided unless you absolutely have to? I just wanted to get uh, the judge's opinion on maybe referencing or citing a Rule 23. I think if you've got a case that is on point or really close to what you have, cite it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I agree. It, it, sometimes a rule 23 is more, more closely fits the facts of a case that's before you. Mm -hmm. right. If you have one, especially right. now in light of the, the change, uh, cite right. it. I, I don't discount it. I like, I like to see where the logic that is in the rule 23 is persuasive. I mean, that's really what you're saying. As I looked at this fact, it's very similar. This fact situation is very similar to what I have. And here's how they parsed it out. Here's how they thought it through. And I, I love looking at that. I love looking at how other judges analyze an issue that uh, is in front of me to see if just to get my own sort of North Star in the right direction. Do I agree with that? Uh, so I don't have anything. I never had anything about Rule 23s. Sometimes people before the change in the Supreme Court rules would try to slip them in. Other justices would just go berserk. I don't really care. I thought if it was persuasive, it was interesting to read. It's fine. Yeah. Well, as a, as a practicing attorney, when I was before the rule was changed, it was always frustrating to have a case that was right. actually exactly. identical uh, yeah. and not being able to use it. So Exactly. Um, let's kind of move then to the next part of, uh, or stay in this argument section a little bit. And I want to ask if you guys have uh, recommendations for new attorneys when they're structuring their argument or analysis portion of their briefs, um, do you recommend they lead with their strongest argument, um, that they, you know, that they add all their arguments and their points um, in, in a particular fashion. Is that something that, you, that you're that you cognizant of when you're reviewing briefs? Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on how to be more persuasive maybe in the argument section. I, you know, my thought is uh, I spent the weekend as much as I could watching the Ryder Cup and I know there's some Cardinals fans, probably some Cub fans and some White Sox fans. You know, it's like baseball, you know, with lineups, you hit them with your best, uh, your best lineup straight out of the gate, so to speak. Um, I think it gets the attention uh, of the reader um, and it focuses your main points um, to the front. That's just my thought. I, I agree with that. You do that and you might be looking at your 18th straight victory in another <laughs> sweep ahead of the Cubs. <laughs> I agree with it, but I, it, with a caveat, it, I start with the elements. What is it that the other side had to prove or that you have to prove and how, and how did that work? How did you do it? Was it done? Uh, the, putting, getting the elements there of whatever it is, civil case, criminal case, whatever, just get the elements in so that they're right there, dot, 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 dot. This, this was done, this was done, this was done, this was done. That helps a whole lot. It just gets your whole argument sort of put, pulled together. So I, I like it when people start with that. Well, and, and to follow up with that is, you know, your a brief you may write on one issue or today may be totally different what, than what you might do next week. It, it kind of mm -hmm. all depends on the case and the dynamics and everything you got going on. So, you know, it's not a cookie cutter. This is the exact way to do it every time you do it. You know, you may modify, you may uh, learn, and let's be honest, you know, brief writing is something that some people are a lot better uh, of than others, even, and same with someone being in the court, you know, some have a better trial court and are better in front of a jury than others, 
but it is all a learning process. Um, and you get better the more you do it and you learn from, you know, your mistakes, you learn from the things you did well and, and nothing's really ever done the same each time. Right. The worst is to have in a brief something that you clearly cut and pasted from some other case that has the wrong names in it or the wrong dates in it or the wrong place in it or the wrong crime in it. I think we've all seen that where just, you know, the cutting and pasting went too fast. No one edited it carefully. And you're looking at a case and you're going, this isn't even this case. It's about some other person. What were they thinking? It, it really hurts your credibility. And the one thing, I mean, you have a reputation that you want to build and always improve on and always enhance. So these kinds of little mistakes, um, you know, they're not helpful. And we, and we see it a lot at the appellate level. I'm sure Judge Mudge, because I, I did at the trial court level, sees it all the time where it's cut and pasted. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I uh, was in a uh, jury trial and the proposed instructions were given to me. And the night before I was reading them, I realized these were instructions from a different case that right. someone had tried in front of one of my colleagues. Uh, and um, I was stayed at the courthouse late and corrected it. I reached out to both lawyers. My, my wife uh, said, what are you doing that for? And I said, well, we got a jury coming in in the morning. And I told them we were going to start at nine o'clock and mm -hmm. I don't want to spend an hour <laughs> fixing it with the lawyers and inconveniencing a, a, a jury. And by the way, speaking of my wife, you said she's the first assistant. She, she uh, actually now works for uh, ILSAP as a special prosecutor and, and has been doing that for a couple of years. She gets down south to Union County. And, and I think uh, Justice Bowie and some of his colleagues have encountered her in the past. Uh, all I got to say is watch out. <laughs> she's done a great job down here. I know that. I apologize about that. I'm sorry. Um, so uh, we have a, a question from uh, one of the, the individuals here, Jordan uh, Vandeveer uh, asks, is there a situation where repeating your argument can be beneficial in the argument section? Um, or, do you, or do you typically see um, attorneys kind of get too repetitive to where you're, it's turning you off or you're starting to, to, to tune out the argument? I think one bite, one bite at that apple, one bite at that issue. You can summarize at the end, in closing, we think we should win because blah, 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 blah. But repeating it, we know it's being repeated. And then we get the, then you have the question in your head, why are they bothering with this? If, if this is their most important argument, why didn't they just make it better the first time? Or are they just trying to fill up pages? Or are, have they just forgotten where they are in this? It, it doesn't, it's not really impressive. You, you know, um... When I got on the bench in 2010, I uh, encountered probably one of the more preeminent trial attorneys in the civil arena. And I asked him, I said, do you have any advice for a young, new novice judge? And the first words out of his mouth was, yeah, tell us to shut up. We all go too long. And, and I see that in brief writing and I also see it in, a, in trials where one witness after the other is asked to reestablish a fact that's not in dispute. And I, I think, why are they doing this? And I'm thinking they're so used to taking depositions and needing to be thorough and cover every base that they forget they're in front of a jury sometimes. And they just mm -hmm. keep repeating and repeating with each and every witness stuff that's already been well established. And so I thought his advice, I kind of laughed at it at the time, but once I, been on the bench for several <laughs> years, I thought, you know, his advice was spot on. So I think that also applies to, to brief writing as well. Well, and to follow up, and uh, a fellow judge of mine once told somebody, you've made your point, you've won your point. The only thing you can do by continuing on is lose your point. <laughs> so, you know, when you've made your point and you think you've won it, stop. Well, I, I've used a line from a famous movie several times. You had me at hello. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I, I have ruled in favor of somebody and they want to keep talking. And I, 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 I don't understand that whatsoever. 
Shut up. <laughs> All he you was. can do is snatch, snatch your victory. <laughs> Um, judges, what are your uh, thoughts on reply briefs in general? Are they always necessary? Are they are they incorrectly utilized? Is there a certain way to utilize them that's more effective in arguing uh, your your client's points? Um, what are your thoughts there? I, I think reply briefs are necessary and good when they actually reply to what the appellee said or the, you know, the respondent said, when I see a reply brief that just regurgitates their opening brief, I'm like, well, that was a waste of my time reading that. So mm -hmm. if you're going to do that succinctly and, and, and um, you know, d reply to what um, the other side has said, get your point across again, make it short, sweet, simple, move on. Right, I agree with that. Um, judges, one of the things is, uh, some of you mentioned earlier, um, was how an attorney's, uh, editing or proofreading of their brief can affect their, uh, credibility, um, and, and your perception of the strength of their case. Can you talk a little bit of more about that and about how important or, or whether or not it's important to be, um, whether it be grammatically correct or whether it be just, um, from an analysis standpoint, um, how does that affect you when you're reviewing these briefs? I'm sometimes surprised at the errors I see in, in uh, memos and briefs, uh, especially in the day and age of spell check. Um, it, it, you know, I try to look past that, but it's a, it is a turnoff. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not going to rule against somebody because they were grammatically incorrect if they're right on the law and the facts, but yeah, you ought to uh, take a look at your brief. Uh, you know, I, I do a lot of repetitive issues and I go back and look at previous orders I've written on similar issues. And sometimes I've, when I've done that, I've picked up uh, grammatical or, or other errors that I made that I didn't catch the first time. Um, so it's, it's, it's surprising, uh, what you will see if you'll put it down and come back a couple of days later uh i think that's that's a wise thing to do and i don't know how justice uh, pachinski does it but in my office um everything we do no matter who writes it who does it everyone looks at it everyone reviews it um everybody puts their feedback in uh, because it is it's easy to and Philip, you've seen this. If, if you've clerked for a, a justice, you, you're reading through what's been uh, provided and you find these little typos. It's easy to lose the trees for the forest. And that right. the more people that can put eyes on that, the better you are. Um, you know, if you work in a, a law firm, uh, you know, have your colleagues look it over. Uh, it, not to mention they'll find typos, but they can all say, you know what, you may want to tone that part down a little bit <laughs> or, <laughs> hey, what about this? You know, so, you know, take some constructive criticism. And, and again, I think it just helps with that learning process and and how to be a better a better writer. Right. I, I think that uh, especially in this age of spell check, it's very easy to just rely on spell check to a computer to correct, to, to find the spelling and the grammar errors. But spell check doesn't find when a whole word is in the wrong place or if a phrase is in the wrong place or if it just doesn't make any sense. So you still have to have eyes on the whole document. And so go ahead and spell check it, that's good. Go ahead and grammar check it, that's good. But you still have to have yourself and someone else actually read the whole document. And this is where pride of place, you can't have any. You have to be willing to accept some constructive criticism, as Judge Boy said, because you want to make you want to make the best impression you can, not only for yourself, but also for your client. And you want your client to think that you know what you're doing. So uh, and remember, these briefs are now available online. So people all over the world are reading them. This is a lot of pressure to get it right. So yeah. Uh, look at spell check, look at grammar check, 
but read it through yourself to make sure that everything is where it belongs to be, that there aren't any extraneous words in there, that, there, that the parts are where they belong in terms of your outline, and that it all together makes some sense to ar- give it your best argument possible for your client. Well, judges, I want to take uh, just a few questions um, from those who've uh, joined us today. Um, Alan uh, Borlack uh, has asked uh, something about reply briefs, and I want to, I want to, I've had, I've had this question myself a few times. So um, when you are on the other side and your opposing counsel gets the final word in a reply brief, um, are you, uh, do you analyze that reply brief any with any more scrutiny uh, in the fact that you know that the other side's not going to be heard in, in regards to it, um, especially if they are maybe taking liberties with uh, the argument, the law, or the facts? I, I don't know how other uh, districts do it, but in our district, generally the reply brief is the end of it. But every once in a while, you see uh, a reply brief filed and then the appellee saying they want to supplement the record with something. And they file a motion and then we, we try to decide whether that's a good idea or not. Of course, both sides get to weigh in on whether that's a good, good idea. But sometimes in oral arguments, you can see that uh, the, you know, the appellant gets the last word and you can just see steam coming out of the ears of the appellees. And really, there's not much we can do at that point. So that's why I'm saying I mean, be prepared. And just like we tell trial attorneys, new trial attorneys, learn both sides of the case. Be prepared to argue both sides of that case because that gives you the preparation you need to argue your side effectively. And while you're doing that, rebut what you expect the other side to say. Yeah, I think Justice Bowie mentioned earlier, make sure the reply brief actually replies uh, to to whatever has been brought up. And it is certainly if something was misstated, uh, it should be pointed out. And I see one of the questions is about how to handle a opposing counsels <laughs> that's uncivil outside of the courtroom, but uh, goody two shoes inside. Uh, it's a struggle and it's a struggle for trial courts to tame some lawyers, I especially lawyers that, you know, I grew up looking up to, you, you know, uh, the, the the icons that, that stray too far. But I, I um, at an EdCon that uh, us judges have been to in the past, uh, incivility was brought up as, and I started citing that, uh, the rules of, uh, that require civility in a courtroom. They don't just apply in a courtroom, they apply outside a courtroom. And if there's an uncivil behavior that's caught in a, a deposition, which I've seen when I've had motions for sanctions or, at, you know, lawyers asking me to admonish people, that's pretty persuasive if I have something that in the record as opposed to a he said, she said thing. Yeah. Um, judges, uh, we, we've got a question here also about footnotes, and that's something that uh, we've, <laughs> we've briefly mentioned. I think uh, Judge Mudge mentioned uh, when you're citing sometimes if there's a long citation or you're going to have a big um, excerpt pulled out or something like that that might ruin the flow of your argument that you you might put it in a footnote. Do you guys have recommendations as to when those are appropriate or if they can be distracting um, and, and how they've been used effectively in, in your review? Well, I, I think cert, certain use of footnotes <clears throat> is normal and probably needed, but sometimes if I'm looking and I've got a large footnote. I'm like, well, if it's that important, why is it in the brief? Right. Why is it just a footnote? <laughs> you know, if it's a footnote, uh, just to maybe explain a relationship or, or why something was done, that's one thing. But if it's making a point or a case that, that, uh, that has some bearing on the case, why is it a footnote? I, I could agree, agree more. <laughs> that, that was actually one of the first, um, experiences I had with a footnote was uh, we were drafting a case, Judge Moore was, and and we were uh, looking at, I had prepared the case law that was dealing with a, a kind of a side issue, but it was relevant to the actual analysis of the case. And and I had it in a footnote and he was, what's, 
he goes, he goes, that's part of the case. He's like, that's gotta be, that's gotta be up in our argument section. So, so don't be afraid to go right. ahead and make your point. Right. It's kind of what you guys are saying here. So that's, that's yeah. important. Right. Well, and I see, and not trying to get in your business, Philip, but I see there, which citation format do we prefer? I'd rather have the ILAP third rather than the Northeast myself. Yes, me too. Same here. And, and that's actually uh, the Illinois court, uh, Supreme Court. That's, I think their preferred, they, they have noted that that's their preferred method. So if you're in an Illinois state court, that's probably your default and you want to go with that. So that's a good question as well. And it's generally, it's one of the shorter ones, which is, is helpful for reading uh, the actual briefs as well. Um, judges, I guess we'll just kind of end here. we got three minutes left. So I've got kind of just a general question, um, which is, uh, can you give us one or two of your your pet peeves, like the things that if someone can avoid um, at all costs, what should it be? Uh, I would like, like, I'd like to just, it's not a pet peeve of mine. I would just like to, the judges that you appear before, either in the trial court or in the appellate court, we're not horrible people. We went through exactly what you're going through when we were young lawyers. And sometimes you see people, their hands are shaking, they're so nervous. Take a deep breath. Try to stay calm. Try to understand that we're just there to listen to you. We're not, we're not there to beat up on you. We're not going to leap over the bench and smack you. It's just try to do everything you can to stay calm so that you can stay organized and you can stay on point. You can answer questions. Um, I understand that it can be nerve wracking, especially, you know, when you're in front of a court of review, in front of a, a judge that you've been before and maybe hasn't always gone your way. I get that. But we all started the same way. And, you know, we're, we're all in the same boat. We're all just trying to do our job as best we can. So um, try and stay calm and carry on like the British did during the Blitz. Stay <laughs> calm and carry on. Yeah, I, I, as a follow up to that, I would encourage young lawyers to be active in your local bar. It's an opportunity to meet judges. Uh, we're, we're not. You, you, I guess we became, we're a little bit defanged when you, you uh, catch us in a, a lighter moment, kind of like this. I, you know, we are all human beings, like uh, the justice said, we've all been through this. Um, but as a pet peeve, this is more for a trial court than appellate court. But my pet peeve is, is somebody walking in and slaps on my bench you know, a two inch thick uh, additional filing that they're arguing on something I've already prepared myself for. I've already read the briefs and somebody brings something in or you're on the eve of trial and they ignore my final pretrial order and they file a dispositive motion when we're supposed to be talking about jury instructions and in trial, uh, you know, uh, procedure and, and, and that. So um, I, I recommend that lawyers, young and old, reach out to a judge's bailiff or judicial assistant, ask him or her what judges prefer in terms of courtesy copies, uh, what they prefer in terms of uh, how and when they're to be delivered. You know, some people really like uh, emails, some people really like uh, proposed orders, you know, find that out in advance. And each judge has their own way of doing things and, and try to get a, the lay of the land. And I think it'll help you out in your uh, practice. And I'll end, and I, I totally agree with the other two judges, both those and to, to what Judge Mudge said, you know, I was lucky enough when I got out of law school to go into practice with my dad. And, and I've said this and, and will say it until I'm gone. You know, he was the best mentor I could ever have. And I think that is key when you're a young attorney is finding a good mentor. And you do that if you don't have the ability in your own firm to what Bill said, you know, go out, meet the judges at the courthouse, meet them out. I know they get together afterwards. So find a good mentor and, 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 and other attorneys who to ask questions and bounce things off of because that's how you learn. Um, and I will end with this. And I would ask Philip to send this out. Um, this is my my plug for the appellate court committee. Is if you all are interested in helping out, 
and doing appeals. Um, I would encourage you to look into the uh, pro bono program for the criminal appeals. Mm -hmm. um, there's some uh, rules regarding if you have less than I think five years of experience, you need to have a, a supervisor, things such as that. And, and I'll send Philip the links to a couple of things, but you know, that would at, at the appellate level would help us out immensely with uh, getting some of the backlog of casework done. And it gives you great experience uh, to do that. So that's my plug. Uh, I appreciate that. So. Well, that's, that's a wonderful opportunity. So we appreciate you uh, mentioning that and uh, send that over to me and we'll, we'll get a blast email sent out to the young lawyer division, uh, makes people aware of it. Um, I just want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, thank you um, for, for offering your lunch hour judges and, and helping us learn how to be more effective advocates and brief writers. Uh, we just cannot say thank you enough. Um, I want to thank everyone who, who showed up today. Again, we'll have our next event November 17th uh, of this year, November 17th. So look forward to that. Another opportunity to, uh, to get everyone together. So thank you all. And I hope everyone has a, a great, wonderful rest of their Wednesday. So take Thanks care. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you.